Lourdes y Vance Michael. Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you all for coming to this uh, quick workshop. Um, what I'll be presenting on is um, different smart cities, technologies, and uh, the new industries that emerge from them and how those address the sustainable development goals nine and 11. Um, so I'll do a brief intro uh, talking about what I do, um, an introduction to smart cities and the industry, how they relate to the sustainable development goals, then I'll go a little bit into the deep technologies in the field and then wrap it up with like a Kahoot and some quick Q&A. Uh, so my name is Micah Nkomar Depio. I am 16 going into 11th grade. Uh, I go to St. Albans School in DC. Um, my relevance to the field is I founded and run a company uh, called Valera Foundation and we build and design uh, smart city cyber infrastructure. Um, I mostly got involved through reading books of cybersecurity, um, finding solutions to the problems, and also cryptocurrency trading and consulting. Um, so the company that I founded, Valera Foundation, has been in operations for around one and a half years. It is a 501c3 research and development uh, corporation. Uh, which, as I mentioned earlier, will create cyber infrastructure to support smart city development. Um, right now, we're in our research phase. We have uh, top PhDs in many fields, especially in the ones that we'll be covering today, forming solutions for uh, smart city infrastructure. Um, we are currently based in LA with development teams in Pakistan and Russia. Uh, we are still in our uh, beginning stages. So while we um, have initial funding for research, we're still uh, getting ready to go for funding for the actual development after we publish all our results. So why do we need smart cities? Um, and how does this interact with the sustainable development goal? Um, well, in the last uh, 20 years, for the first time in history, the urban population has surpassed the rural. And these cause many issues, issues and then also present some advantages. So uh, the issues are the increased urban population puts more strain on city infrastructure. So we need to adapt to the surge of urban population. Um, but then there's also more economic potential. So we need to take uh, hold of that and um, use it to our advantage to stimulate local and uh, national economies. So what smart cities are, are uh, the union of cyber and physical world. Uh, it's a combination of doing processes in the physical world, but then also doing some of them in the cyber world and delegating some work there. Um, it's estimated they will provide 3% in incremental growth uh, globally in $20 trillion in additional economic be uh, benefits over the coming decade. So how do smart cities affect the individual? This uh, relates to the sustainable development goal 11, make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. So by creating something that's connective, um, so everything can communicate with each other, interoperable. Everything uh, is able to communicate to, with each other regardless of uh, systems and then making sure everything is automated. So everything is independent and self-functioning. Uh, you can create a dynamic system that's focused on each individual. So as you have these urban populations rising, uh, lots of the customization um, can be focused on each individual without harming the whole. And everything is optimized for you, the individual, while making sure it works with everyone else. Um, so this is also going to create a societal shift. Uh, we're going to see less um, mental and physical uh, work um, in repetitive tasks. So we sort of offshore human work uh, to the cyber realm. And this will provide more economic benefits by enabling people um, better tools to 
become more productive, um, which would increase their economies. So what do smart cities have to do with Industry 4.0 or the fourth industrial revolution? This ties into Sustainable Development Goal 9, which is to build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. So Industry 4.0, Fourth Industrial Revolution is a sort of sub-segment of smart cities. Um, when smart cities form, Industry 4.0 will also form. And I'll go a little more into detail with that, because um, you may be wondering what are the industrial revolutions. Uh, so the first one brought mechanization, um, steam engines, and this largely improved productivity, which is a theme in every single industrial revolution when you increase productivity uh, significantly and enable your companies and workers to be able to do more um, with using maybe even less resources than uh, an industrial revolution has uh, occurred. So the second one was brought energy, electricity, gas, oil. This created combustion engines which helped uh, automobiles, planes, different vehicles, engines, and then there's a whole bunch of other things, steel, chemical synthesis, telegraphs, telephones. Um, now, leading to where we are now, we're in the third industrial revolution, which largely bought electronics, so tele telecommunications, we got the internet, um, space exploration, biotechnology, uh, and then 52 years later, it's been a while since the third revolution happened, um, but we've expanded upon that with mass production and offshoring. So many companies right now uh, produce things in mass uh, offshore and remote locations. Um, this is why most of the world is reliant on uh, industrial powerhouses like China, because those do that really well. Um, but it uh, has its limits in adapting to the individual, adapting to climate concerns, and uh, the fourth industrial revolution provides a better path towards all that. So industry 4.0 brings data into its processes. So um, data is just information about almost anything. Uh, and with that information, you can do uh, many more things and improve productivity. So a few key things that will happen is manufacturing will be closer to the consumer within smart cities instead of um, outside in uh, offshores and other countries or continents. Most of the offshoring that will be done will just be from machines to the cyberspace. So there will be virtual processes that will take place um, instead of people having to do them themselves. And it will improve the economy and facilitate um, innovative systems using the advanced infrastructure, uh, new business models. There's a lot that can be done with Industry 4.0. So what I'm gonna be going over is sort of the company's uh, stance on smart city infrastructure, what we're focusing on and I'm gonna focus on three key uh, deep technologies. These are the leaders of um, uh, smart city infrastructure, the new ones. So these have the most hype, uh, one of the largest um, financial backings, um, but they're all rather new. Uh, so it's very interesting to get involved and see how they take place. Um, they're all based on the fundamental that data is the new oil. It makes everything just run. Um, and all these technologies uh, surround manipulating data and using it to improve productivity. Uh, Internet of Things links data, uh, the blockchain manages data, and then AI processes data. And in the rest of the presentation, I'll go into more detail of all these different technologies. So. The Internet of Things is everyday things connected to the internet. So what this does is it provides more data than we've seen before. And when you have more data, you have more information to make informed decisions. 
Um, so it connects the physical world to the digital world uh, more closely by providing more data and more input. Uh, another terminology for this is digital twin. Um, so there's a twin for certain things on uh, the internet or virtually represented um, that can be manipulated and controlled easier than a, just a normal physical object. We'll also see a rise in uh, real-time response. So Internet of Things will be um, able to keep up with the real world responding with things as they occur instead of being delayed um, since it's so closely tied to the physical world. Uh, and what the Internet of Things does is it either uh, collects data or instructs data. So collection is known through sensors. So whether that's temperature, um, humidity, there's many different sensors uh, that data can be taken um, to a central server and processed. And then on the other end, you can instruct things. So you can control things remotely. You can control locks. You can control uh, gates. All these things that enable like a more fluid system that's able to um, interact with the internet better. Uh, so we're gonna go over the three main layers. So the first one is sensors. That's one's pretty basic, just the data is inputted. And then it's also uh, from machines and it's also given to machines to complete actions. Then there's also wireless, um, how the data is transferred and then edge computing, how the data is stored. Uh, so the wireless field has been changing over the few years. Uh, the latest um, innovations have been in LP WANs and 5G. So these uh, are not the only wireless frequencies. Uh, and if I didn't clarify, wireless frequencies are how data gets from one place to another. Uh, modern technologies use um, wireless frequencies, which are these uh, um, waves that can communicate data over different distances. And 5G and LP winds are the latest in this. And they have um, their direct opposites and they have each other's strengths and weaknesses. Uh, but both of them are vital for smart cities. Um, LP winds are great for long distance low powered communication, uh, but they do have a low data rate. Um, so if you have a sensor on the side of a building that maybe can only be, uh, have its battery changed every three years, you can't have a high um, demanding frequency that requires you to change uh, the battery often. So you'd go for an LP WAN wireless to maybe transmit a little bit of data about the temperature every hour. Um, in this way, you keep costs down and uh, you can save your energy. And then 5G is the other end of that. 5G is very high data, but it's very energy intensive and it has a very short distance. It's hard to get um, 5G through buildings um, because of the type of waves that they use. Uh, any blockades are very effective in stopping it entirely. Uh, and the integration of these two along with other wireless frequencies enable you to connect the city in the best manner using, uh, depending on the situations. I mentioned an example for LP WANs, 5G would be like two servers that's been collecting data for um, tens of thousands of devices and they need to get that data from one server to another, they would use something like 5G to transmit the large amounts of data. So edge computing is uh, an improvement of cloud. Uh, what cloud computing is, it's what we're using right now. Um, it's physical, uh, how the internet works is there are physical computers very large and very powerful computers stored remotely um, across the world. And so what we are doing right now is accessing those servers 
and connecting to them. And it is providing all the information to form our Zoom video and audio. Uh, so what edge computing changes about this is instead of accessing databases that are countries or continents away, you access data that's very close to you in your city, in your neighborhood, maybe on your street, there will be servers that can process information uh, closer to you. And what this does is it reduces latency. Latency is the time for uh, you to reach the server. As you can imagine, everything that is transmitted, uh, even though it is virtual, it has a physical element to it. And there's a limit to uh, how much data can be transferred. And then also when you're transferring over long distances, it just takes longer for the data to be transferred. Um, so lower latency means more real time reactions, which is great for the internet of things. And most of the IoT data collected by sensors would be taken to edge computing uh, and there'll be more of these. They're a little low powered compared to cloud computing modules, but uh, they offer their own use. Um, cloud computing will not go away. Um, we still need remote large databases, but largely Internet of Things will be based on edge computing. Okay, so I'm going to go through a brief example um, of how it might be useful to uh, you or anyone. Um, so all this Internet of Things adds flexibility, customization, and optimization. An example would be a smart locking system. Uh, if you have a lock on your phone that's verified through uh, advanced security mechanics, so passwords, maybe some biometrics, you eliminate the risk of key copying. Um, no one can copy your key. Uh, people can't steal your key unless they steal your biometric data and your passwords and such. Um, you can manage and grant access to your house more efficiently. So a lot of uh, services are integrating this Amazon. Um, you can lock your door uh, or unlock it or give people access to it. If someone's coming to your house to do a repair, you can make sure that they're let in, even if you're not there automatically without needing to give them a key, which uh, can introduce risks of key copying. You can monitor the lock history who enters, who exits, when they exit, when they enter. And then if you forget to lock your house or something, you can remotely lock it, remotely unlock it. Another example would be like smart lighting system. Um, this one based on uh, different inputs, it can either be outside or inside light. A good example is outside light. There can be a sensor that um, just sees what, how much light there is already. Um, to detect whether it's nighttime or not. And then when it's nighttime, it turns on the outside light. Uh, so this automated um, process using Internet of Things can help individuals. On the industry sort of side, uh, you can have construction put sensors in infrastructure. So on a building, and then you have real time problem detection uh, in resolution. So if you put a sensor for monitoring structural integrity in a building and you have all the mechanics running and it, uh, the diagnosis shows that there is an issue with the building, um, based on the severity of that, you can either notify a company repairman, you can uh, notify uh, local response services, you can evacuate buildings, all this can be automated and can be done faster than a human can process and more efficiently. So the second technology is called blockchain. Um, you may have heard of this technology uh, with Bitcoin, um, but what a blockchain is, is it's a distributed database. Um, so you may be asking, what is a database and how does it become di distributed? So a database is just as it sounds, an entry of data. Uh, so if I had everyone in this room, you could have your names and your phone numbers. 
that would be an example of database. Uh, so a database becomes distributed uh, when people, multiple people have a copy of that database and it's distributed among multiple people. Um, so blockchain takes this as the next level by using different mathematical proofs and things called digital uh, hashing, which are digital fingerprints, which essentially takes a screenshot um, of the bytes and the components of a piece of data to make sure it can't be changed. Um, and these create sort of, I guess, quote unquote, unhackable things as long as the consensus uh, is established um, that eliminates the need to trust other people. So I wouldn't need to trust um, uh, an individual, I could instead trust what the distributed database says. Um, the primary use for this right now is in cryptocurrency. So you have a currency that's stored on the database. And if I wanted to transfer um, a cryptocurrency, then I could transfer on the database, I would enter that I lose, let's say 100 uh, coins, and then you get 100 coins. And all this would be agreed upon and recorded so that I can't now use that hundred and now you can use that. Um, that's essentially the basics of cryptocurrency and blockchain. Uh, the advantages, there are no middlemen. Uh, you can do more processes uh, acting person to person. You don't need a third party. Um, in the case of cryptocurrency, they can be non-inflationary, not subject to uh, annual inflation, and then they also have no real control. So the government can't really take it. Uh, if it's developed properly, um, it's completely decentralized and there's no authority that controls any of it. So uh, it'll work regardless of who's in power or how the servers are doing. So blockchain smart contracts. This is a subsection of blockchain. Uh, and they are executable contracts harder in encode. So instead of just a normal database of uh, a person has this amount of information or this person has this amount of funds, it's a contract or uh, a program that can execute. For example, when I send you a hundred coins, um, you will automatically send me uh, a digitized receipt for something. Uh, this could be executed in a smart contract and it's executed on every machine that has the database. Um, so this drastically uh, enables peer-to-peer -peer and reduces and takes out the middleman completely. And you can form agreements in different contracts, uh, there are different uses in real estate. Uh, and, in developing countries, you can use this um, for arbitration systems, uh, decentralized law, there's many different use cases. So here are just five um, key values of blockchain in smart cities, specifically on the business side and what happened before and what they're changing to. So we move from third parties to trusted algorithms so third parties is just like uh, anyone facilitating uh, trust in the place of peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. Like you can't um, go out and have a, a reasonable trade with anyone. Normally people use sites like eBay, Amazon, different uh, arbitration systems and trust systems because uh, they, tr they both trust the third party and they don't trust each other so they go with the third party with blockchain all of that is hard coded and there is mathematical uh, verifications that you can do to ensure that you don't need to trust anyone and once you have that control the amount of fees go down uh, so trusted algorithms uh, are way better in terms of efficiency and costing so it moves from multiple databases to a singular database. If you have multiple companies working together, having a singular database that everyone is agreement upon, uh, maybe it's inventory, uh, just make sure that everything flows better. Uh, we move from modifiable records to immutable records. 
the past will not be reverted. So while this uh, can introduce some issues of mistakes, normally this just prevents anyone from maybe promising a good and then reverting. Uh, none of that can happen. Everything once done is completely recorded in the code and you can't go back and change that. Uh, so that has an additional use cases and security and such. Um, this can also be used for recording documents. You can record a, like a digital fingerprint of a document in the blockchain. And then if you go back later, you can see whether it's been changed or not. Uh, and if even one uh, bit of data has changed, then the blockchain would say that it has been changed. Um, so we go from opaque records to transparent. So you enable any intended recipients to be able to view the ledger at uh, all time. Um, this just drastically improves uh, interoperability between different companies. They can work together um, by granting access to their own ledgers. And then five, probably the most important one is you move from fault prone to fault tolerant um, systems. So with the normal database or contract, if a machine fails, uh, the ledger can fail uh, and you will lose data. With blockchain, multiple machines have the data. And if even one of them has it on there and normally there's thousands of them, even one of them has it, then it can be replicated and you don't lose the data completely. Um, so an example of this uh, is self-sovereign identities. This is where you control your own identity on online. So instead of having multiple accounts, you have a single identity, similar to how uh, Google um, has your email and you can sign into different things with that. Uh, the G Suite apps and even external apps that have that integrated. Uh, this is just on a whole nother level where it's even more control for you since Google doesn't control it. Um, you actually control it and no one without your keys can control it. Uh, there's less risks of data leaks um, and people can't misuse your data as much. Uh, and then there's also complex mechanics called zero knowledge proofs. Um, this is a fairly complicated mathematical topic, but you can authenticate information without giving uh, the actual information itself. So if someone needed me to prove I was um, a student, there's different proofs that I am a student without needing to tell them where I go to school. Uh, so you can control what is revealed to companies and it represents you and your virtual identity online and gives you more control over that. And the industry side, a very basic example is blockchain supply chains. So using uh, different agreements, you can set up different supply chains on the blockchain on a database. So this sets up automatic payments, uh, automatically informs parties when to produce uh, what goods you can automatically pay people um, cryptocurrency compared to normal uh, US dollars or whatever currency you're operating in is much faster and uh, especially for um, international transfers, they can happen in let's say 30 seconds. Uh, they're very low cost, some of them, most of them cost less than a cent, uh, bar Bitcoin, some of them are even free. Uh, but you can have many micro payments uh, without needing to worry about that. And then another thing is optional transparent. So consumers can monitor and track the products that they consume. So uh, companies can enable you to look at where your products have been, uh, what uh, companies they've been with, and you can just see the lifetime of that. Okay, so now to our third and final um, technology, we move on to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, you may have heard about it. Um, it's a big buzzword. There's many like movies and sci-fis on it taking over the world and such, but it simply is a creation of programs that can 
emulate or uh, try and copy uh, human learning and human problem solving. Uh, so th with this, we can augment jobs, which will enable more creative empathetic jobs and also improve productivity since um, many of this, uh, these programs will take over um, certain repetitive tasks. Um, so what machines did for physical labor, AI will likely do for mental labor. It's right now in its early stages, um, but it's continuing to advance um, significantly and shows great promise. As you can see in the bottom left, there, uh, AI is a broad category and there's machine learning and deep learning. Uh, most of the time people discuss deep learning when they're talking about AI, um, but that's just an interesting distinction to make. Uh, so you may be not wondering, how does it work? Well, it's almost entirely based on math. Um, it's very mathematical, uh, complicated stuff using different weights and uh, systems, but very simply put, you take um, inputs uh, from any source. Let's say you have a video camera, the inputs could be the different color, uh, the different pixels. You would take all that information, you would pass it through these hidden layers, which do these mathematical work, and then you receive an output. So you could put an input of a picture um, of let's say a dog, the hidden layers would use the different pixels to try and characteristics to try and see what it was. Then it would produce an output like it is a dog, or maybe you would say it's a cat. And then once you train it, so you put large amounts of data through the neural network, you eventually get a system that can learn from itself and improve upon itself. So as you put more data through it, it improves. Uh, so this is one type of deep neural network in that normally the most common, this was the largest jump for AI, um, but that's simply how it operates. So a use case for AI for the individual it just bridges the gap between humans and machines. Um, a long time ago, we just had code. Now we have applications. Um, now we're seeing more integration of voice, uh, uh, Alexa, Google, Siri, all these things use different AI mechanics to make sure that they can understand what you are saying. Um, this helps uh, just with multitasking, helps people with disabilities. There's a lot of things. Uh, it helps better, allows you to have better access to knowledge, um, ask questions, and uh, a key use case is translation. The translation AI has gotten really good in um, translating languages. Um, while it's still improving now, if you have like a Google um, earbud, some of them come with translations. You can have a conversation with someone in a language you have no idea about, and you can hear them uh, in the language that you understand, and then they can hear you in the language that they understand. In the business side, we see industry 4.0 um, use advanced robotics. So physical emulation is done through robots and then uh, mental emulation is done through AI. And when you combine these, you have a machine that's capable of simple human tasks. Um, example of this like computer vision, if you have a camera that's able to identify different people and then uh, control actions or parts based on that. Um, it just improves efficiency, um, which will ultimately improve the economy as a whole. You can also replace dangerous operations because um, many of these uh, dangerous things to operate require humans in them. Even if the physical work is being done by robots, you still need the humans uh, or some form of intelligence to be able to operate them. Um, so when you substitute physical work uh, with robots and then substitute the mental work with AI, you can remove the human involvement. So 
that's the general gist of these three technologies. Um, how they work together, similar to a nervous system or a body. You can imagine the city as a body. Um, the nerves are the Internet of Things. So these collect uh, inputs of data from many different things uh, and provide them to the brain. So this is just like you feeling things. Uh, the brain is like blockchain AI. Blockchain can store, like your brain store, manage um, information, and then AI can process that. You can think about things, and then it can ultimately um, send the actions out back to uh, your nerves, uh, which, and then you can control your muscles that way. So the similar way, uh, it's a cycle. You go through IoT to blockchain to AI, and then the AI can instruct the IoT again. Um, and these work towards both the sustainable development goals nine and 11 in smart cities. And uh, that's the general overview of it. Um, so this is a encompassing example of uh, how the AI, um, all these different technologies can work to uh, improve the individual and industry um, uh, efficiencies. So you wake up, you tell your personal assistant to bring your car. Um, your car was in a decentralized autonomous vehicle carpool earning you passive income. So this would be a blockchain thing that you sign up for your car at this point in time in the future. Um, artificial intelligence has uh, gone to a point of where the vehicles are completely autonomous um, and safe. And while this, since this is the case, you can rent out your car when you're not using it for additional income. So when you wake up, your car arrives and resets to your customized settings based on your um, uh, single sovereign identity. You leave the house, the lock sensing you left, uh, turn off the lights and heat programmed, you have energy savings. Um, as I mentioned before, your car would use AI for analyzing the sensors, um, computer vision, uh, and different other mechanics for reading the environment around it to make sure that it can navigate the road safely. It can also connect to other IoT devices. And if there was a proper smart city infrastructure, it would be able to determine the least path uh, of resistance and least traffic. Um, uh, you can just, at this point in time, get on your phone, check your messages for the day. Uh, you don't need to always um, be driving because uh, the AI at this point will surpass human response times and uh, security in terms of everything. So while driving, your car runs a diagnostic using IoT devices. It shows that it needs an exhaust change. Your car informs other cars around it about the exhaust engine so that they can incorporate um, an exhaust engine failure into their algorithms. It's already there, but um, possibly it could be more of a possibility. And if there's any erratic movement, they can move in the safest and most efficient way. Um, when you arrive at work, your car heads to the dealership. Um, you already have the uh, car registered under your sovereign identity and your warranty is valid. Um, so it's all going to be paid for. Uh, your car automatically drives to the dealership. Um, apparently, the dealership was out of stock, so they contact their suppliers to ship the parts using the smart uh, supply chain. Uh, the delivery will arrive after you get home from work. So the dealer notifies you and informs uh, you that they will send you a rental car, another autonomous vehicle with all your presets. So as you um, end work, get in the car, you lock in with your SSI and then give access to your preferences. Um, you now have just essentially the same as your old car. Um, it'll be able to drive almost the same. So your car drives you home and tomorrow when you request it, uh, it'll be fully repaired. Okay, so what Valera does bringing back to my company is just we just do all these processes. We do N10 smart city infrastructure. So uh, we have internet of things, protocols, security, um, routing, et cetera, blockchain. We made sure to design a blockchain. And then for AI, we've worked on developing a marketplace and making sure that 
the algorithms can be uh, processed. So a key issue with this that I haven't addressed yet is that um, as you increase the reliance on technology, the damage that uh, comes with the failure of those technologies also increases. Um, so what we do at Valera is we make sure that all our technologies are decentralized, secure, and scalable. So we make sure everything uh, is secure, private, um, through the best cryptography, and then our selling point and what we do completely differently is decentralization. So this means that there's no um, single point of failure or nothing controlling everything. Uh, this drastically reduces uh, the damage and potential to system. Because if we have a single um, authority managing an entire smart city, if they're compromised, uh, and they probably will be with the growing number of cyber attacks, um, the effects of that will be catastrophic. So what we do is we design all our architectures decentralized so that everything that is compromised is limited to its specific area. Um, so how to get involved, uh, check out valera.org. It's mainly uh, just a subscription box, I haven't added anything um, because most of our information is confidential at this time. Uh, many of the patents are still going through and we're still working on things, but uh, it's good to keep updated. Uh, take classes and courses in the field. I recommend edX.org. They have some great resources and such. And then now, uh, if you have any further questions, you can email me at micah at valera.io, reach out to me on Instagram or uh, whatever, uh, whatever you want. Um, and then right now, I will uh, answer any questions you have and then we can play a short coot. And then uh, at the end, if you email me, I can send you uh, a small prize in uh, cryptocurrency. Michael, do you want to take the Kahoot first and then proceed with the Q&A segment? Okay, yeah, that works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, let me share. Can you see the Kahoot? Um, no, your presentation is still visible. Okay, give me one second. Can you see it now? Yes, it's visible. Okay, I'll put the game pin in the chat. Okay, great. Um, for anybody, uh, for anyone who does not know how Kahoot works, you can um go to www.kahoot.it and then enter this game pin, and you should be in here.
Is that everyone? Is everyone in? I think there are a couple of people who haven't joined, but we'll just wait for like a minute and then okay. everyone just to join can join. Um, if you, you can all check the chat. Go to kahoot.it and just enter the game pin and you should be there. Okay, I'm gonna begin, unless anyone has underwent. And the, in case anyone doesn't know, the game is point based and the faster you respond, the uh, more points. Yeah. And it's 20 seconds to answer. Yeah, I was in the last 20 years. Low power, low data, low energy. Great. <laughs> 
So yeah, there's a lot of vulnerabilities with um, security, social, but uh, yeah. There was a diagram on this, but I didn't mention it too often, but uh, yeah. It's three options. Uh, it would change life for everyone, um, everyone involved in the city, uh, and uh, even it would change urban, uh, rural populations as well. But yeah, that's it. And, um, So uh, you can email me. I think you have my email there. Uh, and I can talk to you about a prize. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you, Mika. We will now be hopping on to the Q&A segment for this particular workshop. Okay. So if you have any questions, um, kindly put them in the chat and the admins will read them out. Also, if everyone can turn on their videos for the Q&A session, that would be great. So there are already like two questions in the chat. So first one is from Inaya, who is there from Kuwait. So what helped you found a company at the age of 16? Getting involved is one thing, but founding something at such a young age is another beside inspiration. What goals and key foundations helped you build up your own company? She wants to get an insight as to how you can, you know, get involved or create something while people are still kids. Yeah, uh, great question. So... The key thing was um, understanding the industry. Uh, all this um, technology, as I mentioned, is very new. Um, so not a lot of subjects like this that um, you can get involved in uh, because there's just decades of research and uh, innovation. But for this specific industry, I was able to like catch up to the people at the top of their industry since it's been so new. Um, so I was able to uh, catch up and then from there create innovations. Um, from there, it was just finding the right people to work with. Uh, I found someone online, a great uh, co-founder. Um, they can, people can work with you if you tell them your idea and they like it. Uh, um, inspiration, uh, what goals and key foundations? So, I've always been uh, interested in using technology to help people. So I've always looked at how can I use this to uh, improve the world as a whole. Um, so I've just, that's been my base and that's why I created a nonprofit. Um, uh, insight how to get involved. Okay, um, yeah, people just think you're a kid. Um, it is a problem that uh, I face, um, but when you know enough about the industry and you can defend your points and you know just as much or more than most adults in the industry and you also have a credible team to back you up, 
that improves things a lot significantly. Um, I'd say the biggest thing is getting a good team around you. Uh, but to get to that point is very hard. It takes a lot of work. Um, you, but the biggest one is just get familiar with whatever you're trying to understand. Uh, it would be best if it's a new air industry, because if not, it's very hard to create something in a industry that's been there for decades. Um, so if you can find something that's new and niche, um, it's a lot easier. Uh, and yeah, that's the general gist. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is from Jin. They want to know how did you ignite your company and keep updated with all the AI technologies? Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so great point. Um, so I spend a lot of time, like a few hours a day, like reading um, different papers. And uh, I worked with um, several top like PhD developers in designing, in writing uh, technical papers. And uh, so really working with the industry experts, that's probably the best way. These people have had, uh, they've been in the industry as long as it's been around. They have PhDs surrounding it, they work with it. Um, so working with those people, having calls with them, uh, they were of course contractors who worked for the company, um, but that's mainly how I stayed on top of it. Uh, working with them forces you to keep up with them, um, reading different articles, the newest papers, and just uh, making sure you're in tune with everyone you're hiring is how I did that. Good question. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we are kind of reaching towards the end for this particular session. Yeah. So I will be sending in Michael's information in the chat. You guys can email him if you have any further questions. Also, I'm sending the link for the help desk for today. So if you have any questions about the summit or any of the muni programs, you can hop onto the help desk. Um, there'll be um muni students present there to answer any of your questions. And before we conclude, there's also a message from one of our Muni program, which is Mun at Home, just for high school students, if they want to know more about how to do MUNs. And before we leave, um, if we can take a screenshot for this session, that would be great. So can everyone turn on their videos? All those who can, can you turn on your video so I can take a quick screenshot for this session? Great, okay, so I'll just take a screenshot now so everyone can give me the best poses. Okay. And we'll take one more. Okay, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Micah, for presenting. Thank you to all the participants. Um, we have one more day of the summit left, which is day three, and we have more sessions today. So make sure to sign up and you can RSVP for the social hour today and tomorrow. Niharika, do you want to add on anything? Did you say Micah? Oh, wait, I said Niharika. My okay. mm -hmm. But if you want to add on anything, Micah, feel free to. No, no, no. That's what I, I thought you said. <laughs> Uh, and no, I don't have anything to add on. I think you've covered everything. Great. Also, you can find this um session on YouTube for Man Impact. So if you want to, you know, in the future, look back at the session, it would be available on our YouTube channel. So yes, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, I will be ending the session now. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you, Micah. Thank, thank you. you.